This show is sponsored by the law firm of Tony Kalagarakis and Associates. Sometimes we never get a chance to meet our clients. Wrongful death is not easy for the family. At the Injury Lawyers of Illinois, we focus on what we do best, car and truck accidents. We're very selective with the cases we take on. We understand and approach every case as if it's the only case in the office. We spend so much time on a given file that we relate to that particular client. The ultimate goal is to make the client whole, is to put that client in the same position as they were prior to the accident ever happening. A client has to understand where their case stands. We speak their language. We have individuals in our firm that are fluent in eight different languages. The client is aware with regards to what's going on in their case at every level. A lot of people out there don't realize that the big insurance companies are not primarily focused on their treatment, their health. We are. After all, it's the client's interests that we have in mind. We know how to start a case and we know how to end a case with a successful resolution. We have the resources, we have the knowledge, we're local. We've handled thousands of cases regarding car and truck accidents. That's what we do. My name is Tony Kelligarakis, and I'm the managing attorney at the Injury Lawyers of Illinois. Hello, and welcome everyone. On behalf of Shomira Media, my name is Samaria Hermes, and here with me today, we have the author of The Assyrian Prophecy, Dr. Ron Susek. Dr. Susek, thank you for joining us. It is wonderful to be with you. Thank you for the privilege, and I'm really looking forward to the coming moments. I, I know your brilliance, and uh, really, I'm so glad that we're together and uh, that God is going to give us a wonderful time as we talk to our many friends around the world. Absolutely. Likewise, I'm very honored to sit down with you. We've had a brief conversation in the past, and you are just so insightful, and I'm happy that we're here today. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to get right into it and, and ask you, how did you become aware of this prophecy, Dr. Susak? Well, it actually began some 30 years ago when I was sitting in my little study at our old home and I was reading through the book of Isaiah. And I saw this prophecy in Isaiah 19 and I would have walked right by it like probably millions have. Uh, because it, it didn't make any sense. And what hooked my mind was when I saw the word Assyria. Now, what hooked me was the fact that I thought there was no Assyria. They were destroyed in 612 BC. So how can there be an Assyria? How could they possibly, uh, other than being resurrected out of the dust, how could they fulfill this prophecy? And uh, I did not pursue this. It pursued me. That question kept coming back to me. Uh, for, for a number of years, and then I began to do some research, and, and eventually I met an Assyrian, uh, a man named Reverend John Bucco, and he introduced me to different media that, where I could learn more about the Assyrians. And then when, uh, when we went in and took out Saddam Hussein, that is when I really came to grips with this thing, when I realized that there was about a million and a half Assyrian Christians living in northern Iraq. I was blown away. And then uh, the, the man that I had first met, uh, uh, Reverend Bucco, he challenged me to write a book about the Assyrians. Well, I, I said, I'll do it someday, but I, I have a lot of research ahead of me before doing that. Well, then when we, I realized there were a million and a half Assyrians in northern Iraq, I, I, I began to really get stirred in my interest and began to, to follow the Assyrians and do more research. Then in 2014, when ISIS attacked, I knew who Satan was after. These were my brothers and sisters in Christ, the Assyrian people of the prophecy. And uh, I was really stirred. And that's when I felt challenged in 2014. I've got to dive into the middle of the ocean of the knowledge about the Assyrians. And I say the middle of the ocean because there's more uh, written about the Assyrians 
in literature than there is about the Roman and Greek empires. And I didn't realize that when you begin to study the Assyrians, you've got a deep dive. But that is what stirred me then to, to write this book. And my prayer is that God has tremendous plans for what he's going to do in and through this book. Absolutely. And I'm sure that you know, you know, there, Assyrians are worldwide. We live um, in the diaspora. I'm sure you've met plenty of Assyrians, just as you mentioned. Were there any others that really were the driving force behind this as well? Any that stick out to you in particular? Well, there were two that kind of were rocket launchers for me. One was Sabri Atman. And Sabri uh, was one of the first Assyrians that really listened to me. And the reason was very simple. He said, Ron, you're not, you are being stonewalled by the Assyrians, not because of you, but because we have been betrayed so many times, we don't have any idea who to trust. And so Sabri was the one who heard me out and, and trusted me. And then I went to California to meet for the first time Assyrian leaders. And uh, one that we were to meet at a Starbucks was a man named David Lazar. Uh, married to Ninva Lazar. And uh, David was a very brilliant man, a very straight thinker, a straight shooter. And uh, we met over a cup of coffee and a friendship formed so strongly that we decided to have dinner again the following Saturday night. And that Saturday night, we had a great conversation about an hour and a half long about Assyria. And, uh, and that friendship just developed all the more until he was the one who began to send me books and advise me and counsel me. I was on the phone with him many times asking him questions because I was, I was an absolute novice diving in to the Syrian, ba uh, Syrian background and knowledge. And I remember at that meeting, that dinner meeting on a Saturday night, that uh, I, we, we were talking about when will this prophecy be fulfilled? And he said, well, maybe in two or 300 years. And I said, no, I think it might be in our lifetimes. He laughed so loud, I heard his voice bouncing off the walls. He wasn't laughing at me, he was laughing at the impossibility of this. And, and I said, uh, David, we, we knew each other well enough to you know just refer to each other by first names. And I said, David, with God, nothing is impossible. Let's believe him and let's begin to move forward and see if this may not happen in our lifetimes. And um, then, of course, he died a year later, which was a really kick in the stomach for me because he was such a key person in guiding my research and my studies and giving me his wisdom and knowledge, vast knowledge. And uh, yet I had to trust God with the wisdom of uh, permitting that to happen. It's such an untimely time for me. But uh, by the grace of God, I, I wrote about him in uh, my forward or in the introduction because uh, I, I am praying that 10,000 David Lazars will rise out of his death and begin to aggressively advance the Assyrian cause as he did. Absolutely. So it seems, Dr. Susek, that, you know, you've had all of these great um, stepping stones along the way. You've met so many brilliant Assyrians who have helped you. Um, now, you are committed to the Great Commission. How does helping the Assyrians and how has all of this formed? What is how do Assyrians fit into that? That's a tremendous question. Thank you for asking that. I've been involved in doing Great Commission summits for Christian leaders around the world, mainly in cross Africa. And uh, we are seeing an out great outburst from that of, uh, and, and our whole goal is to bring the church worldwide back to the pure and simple gospel that Jesus commissioned us to take to the ends of the world. And it's wonderful to see these leaders really get excited anew, come back to their first love for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as an evangelist, that's the central passion in my heart, and that is to get the gospel out to the world. And so I had to scratch my head at first and ask God, why, why are you drawing me so powerfully uh, into this Assyrian project? I mean, it, it began a number of years ago, and it's day and night for me. My whole soul is into this. And here's the number one reason. The Assyrians became the the first great evangelist of the church. 
Our Western history does not know about this, tragically so. But they advanced the gospel all the way from northern Iraq, which was not Iraq then, it was Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers. But barefooted, carrying a loaf of bread in one hand and a Bible in the other, they marched all the way to China, 3,400 miles away, to teach the gospel all across Asia, Asia, all the way down into India. And they left in their wake some 60 to 80 million believers. Tremendous evangelistic force. They were the first voice of the gospel, major voice of the gospel, as a nation to the world. Then they were beaten into the ground by Islam and has, have suffered tremendous persecution, even martyrdom, unbelievable massacres, oppression, and driven into silence for centuries. I believe that the time is coming when God is going to raise up the Assyrians now to become an end-time voice of the gospel. Now, how would this work? Very simple. When Assyria is being raised up by the power of God and the people God is going to use to raise them up again, you and I know that the cameras of the world will be focused on the Middle East, wondering how can this be happening? This will be as unbelievably miraculous as Israel's return in 1948. But as they return, what we do know will be the, is that the cameras of the world are going to be there. The news media will be all over the place. Who are you? What are you? How are you doing this? Why are you doing this? And I'm, I'm talking to Assyrian leaders now and pleading with them to understand you are not being raised up of God to go back to be what you were as an empire when you were building an empire. You're going back to be the kingdom builders of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Stand in front of those cameras and say, we are people of the cross. We are the people of the gospel, and we are here to tell you the way of salvation. They will become the greatest evangelistic force, I think, in the end times. And so a friend of mine, a theologian friend of mine said, well, Ron, the Assyrians then are the bookends of the church age. Yes, they will be. They were the great voice when the gospel was launched and they will be the great voice after all of this suffering as the world is, is coming into its end time days. And so that's what is the passion in my heart, to see the gospel planted, not just with a few missionaries, but with millions of Assyrians as a nation that is committed unto Jesus Christ. Dr. Susak, you mentioned briefly what Sabri Atman had told you, and many Assyrians know of the Semele massacre, the Seifo genocide, and as you mentioned right now, many genocides that we have faced even in modern day times. How do all of these genocides play a part in what's to come for the Assyrian people? I mean, you have this renewed passion and this hope for the Assyrian people, whereas, you know, a, a people who have gone through many genocides are not really as optimistic as you are. I fully understand that. And maybe that is why God has chosen to bring in an outsider, because I don't have the weight of that. I've been through some experiences in life where I, I can relate somewhat with empathy but I can't relate to someone who has had family members raped and abducted and sold into slavery, murdered. Uh, those things are so foreign to my experience. But I have to tell you that they are not foreign to my emotions. And uh, I get stirred. It troubles me to the depth of my being that this has happened and that it's happening today. All the thievery, all the abuses, and that, and that, the Assyrians have done everything in their ability to reach out to the world by helping the world in two wars, as well as by appealing to the world for their help. And every time they are betrayed and slam dunked into obscurity and abused and neglected and violated. That really tears at me. And that roused me up all the more in my spirit to say, you know what, enough, enough. It is time now to rise up as the generation who will believe God. We've got to believe God for the impossible. We cannot pull this off, but only a God can open seas and drop giants and drop walls and melt armies and rearrange nations. And he has done it in history. He can do it and he will do it. 
And uh, as Father Bet Rasho, a good friend of mine and a great asset in what I'm doing, uh, said, in fact, he, I quoted him in the book. He says, you know, uh, uh, what generation is going to be ready to believe God, genuinely believe God? And the only way that this can happen is, number one, that we reawaken real pulsating hope in the Assyrian heart. The pulsating hope that our God, uh, well, let me, let me just back up a second. I know that the question always comes to mind, yes, but where was God when these horrible atrocities were happening? I have a whole message on the theology of suffering that I am longing to bring to the Assyrian people as soon as this pandemic is lifted and I can begin to speak to them in person around the world. I want to share with them biblical reasons, sound biblical reasons for why God, watch this, allows his choice servants to go through the deepest of suffering and loss. It began with his son, Jesus Christ, his choice son, his choice servant, who gave himself all the way to the death on the cross. And then the father raised him up. That same God, even though he allows, let me back up again. I've been privileged in my ministry over the years to travel many parts of the world. And in so doing, I have been honored to meet some of the greatest saints that have ever lived. Some are so very famous, most of them are obscure and unknown. All of them, without exception, became these rare people through incredible suffering. And none of them would trade that in for anything. Now we have a nation that God has entrusted with, that you're the work of his hands. And we don't like how much heat and pain it takes for God to shape us into the likeness of his son, but it demands that. And I'm longing to bring this message of the theology of suffering. And by the way, I'm not the first one to do that. One of the greatest parts of my book is where uh, a patriarch is addressing Assyrians after one of the great massacres. And I'll, I'll never forget his words. He said, perhaps our cup of suffering is not yet filled. He understood that there's a divine reason in suffering that we're not going to understand on this side of seeing the Lord. But what I do know is that out of this suffering will, be, will come the nation of people worthy and prepared and equipped, not only in thought but in spirit, to rule the world with Jesus Christ in, in Israel and Assyria and Egypt. Wow, that was very insightful, Dr. Susak. So I like that you really reiterate, you know, although we have gone through quite a bit of suffering, um, and like I said, more of a pessimistic approach at times, but to have an optimistic voice, I mean, truly, I mean, even for myself, I recall just seeing the Assyrian prophecy on Facebook. And, you know, I, I text some of my friends and we did a little bit of research and here is this person completely really detached from the Assyrian community showing such a great interest and you know there's there's a book and there's a prophecy that he's speaking on so really it's a renewed sense of hope um, that I think a lot of the Assyrians are seeing so thank you for sharing that I have to tell you that that is my prayer that hope will become solidified faith and faith will become solidified action and we are no longer going to take no for an answer from the world. We are no longer going to let them look away and walk away. That's not going to happen. And uh, we're going to become a strong voice in the Holy Spirit of God. And at some point, the right person is going to hear that message, read the book, bump into the Assyrian strength of faith, and discover this is real stuff. The reason why the world has been able to keep walking on the Assyrians and ignore them is because they have them classified as minorities, a minority. I was infuriated in 2014 as ISIS was advancing and kidnapping, raping, slaughtering, dumping bodies in, into holes in the desert. I was infuriated because never once do I recall hearing the news say these are Assyrians. They would say more Christian minorities were killed today. Well, a minority is a faceless, nameless 
useless entity to people who have a McDonald's on the corner. Everything's fine, Ma. Let's watch the news. Let's say, isn't that too bad? Go to bed, get asleep, and get up and go to the movies. No. That is what we've got to break out of. I will not let 2014 pass into history. 2014 was the, the line of demarcation. That is when Satan went one step too far, as far as I'm concerned. And we're going to come back at him as a nation. And we are going to see the church rise up worldwide. This is why my main work and why I'm so thankful that you're having me on this, this uh, interview is because my main passion is to awaken the church and the world worldwide to who these Assyrians are, who they are in history, fall in love with them because they are our future along with Egypt and Israel. And they have a special place in God's plan and we better honor that. And now is the time. Do you realize, I know you do, I'm saying, I'm talking uh, just kind of my excitement here. Do you realize that the Assyrians are really the parent church of the global church of today. I know it was the apostles. Yes, they were the ones who were the initial ones going out. But I'm talking about the Assyrians became the first nation committed, and they won all these millions of people across Asia into China and India. And out of that, then Christianity began to move to the West. The Assyrians happened to be the parents of the great church of today of 2.2 billion believers. It is time for her children to come to her aid. And it is time to, to, for us to realize who they are and to stand with them along with Israel and the church in Egypt until by the power of God, God has brought this prophecy to fulfillment under his son when he comes as the Messiah. Dr. Zusek, I really like that you mentioned, you know, that the Assyrians are lumped into a Christian minority group. A lot of times our identity is swept under the rug. And like, you know, I've heard uh, Middle Eastern Christians, Iraqi Christians, Kurdish Christians even, um, never really Assyrians, which brings me back to my next question is, um, you know, I've heard a lot of people say that uh, pre-conversion to Christianity, the Assyrians were, I mean, so well versed, the people of civilization, they had so many accomplishments under their belt. Um, post-Christianity, you know, post-conversion to Christianity, we see a lot of we see a lot of massacres, we see a lot of genocides, we don't see a lot of advancements for the Assyrian people. Um, what is your response to that, and why do you think that is? Well, first of all, the Assyrians are some of the most extraordinarily gifted people on earth. Brilliant, well put together people in every way, and they are creators, they are geniuses. They, were, they did form the cradle of civilization, which we are enjoying today, three and four thousand years later. No question about that. The Assyrians went from great empire builders to kingdom builders. In an empire builder, you're, you're a king, you're, you're a power center. In the kingdom building of the kingdom of God, you're a servant, as Jesus was a servant. No one looked weaker on earth than Jesus going to a cross. Little did they know he would be endued with the authority of God to defeat the entire satanic world, to redeem the farthest star in the universe, to redeem all of mankind, and to come back as the Lord and Savior and Messiah of the world and the universe. And there is no one, as someone puts it in a simple way, no cross, no crown. No one gets to a place of divine authority without severe suffering. And Assyria has been taken through that in the shaping of God's hands for now uh, many, many centuries. And what I do know is that God never puts us through something just because he enjoys torture. That is not God at all. He's a God of everlasting love. He's a God of perfection. He's shaping us to be in the likeness of his son. And, 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 Samaria, there is nothing more coveted in the universe than authority. That's why Satan attacked God. He wanted his authority because the person that has the ultimate authority speaks existence in and out of being, sets all law, determines all things, 
And Satan, that malignant, horrible creature, wanted the authority, and he's a murderer and a liar. We know what he would have done with that authority. Jesus stripped him of that authority authority on the cross and all authority in heaven and on earth was given to Jesus because of what he endured in suffering for his father all the way to the point of death. And now he's raising up this body of people and the Assyrians are the front runners of this. Through suffering, through loss, through setback, through obscurity, he's shaping and molding because they are going to rise up with the authority of heaven to rule the world with Jesus and with Egypt and Israel. What, when you are being prepared for that kind of a position, you have got to have all foolishness driven out of you. You have got to have all selfish intentions driven away because we are talking about having God place in Assyria the authority of the Almighty. And so what I'm trying to say is that yes, it has been a long, dark, deep, confusing tunnel. But as, a, as Assyria is being lifted out of that tunnel and raised to her position eventually uh, under the Messiah, she is going to be handed a scepter that you can't entrust to someone who has not been shaped. Wow, that was very profound, Dr. Susak. It reminds me of the Assyrian proverb that you had put in your book. Um, and I actually like to read it directly so I don't misquote it, but it says, he who drinks of the waters of the Euphrates, though he may travel to the end of the earth, will one day return to drink again. Um, and you know, as an Assyrian, here we are modern day all around the world. Do you think that's a pretty accurate foreshadowing of what's to come for the Assyrian people? Do you see that uh, happening? And why did you choose that proverb specifically? <laughs> Well, I know that the Assyrians I have met, whether they plan to go back, if that door opened or not, every one of them expresses a longing for home, a longing for the homeland, a longing to go back. And, uh, and they're going to go back. There's no question about that. Just as real as Israel is going back. And that began officially in 1948 in a wonderful way. And slowly but surely, she's being rounded up and God's going to round up the Assyrians. My greatest concern right now is that I think that the diaspora is the most dangerous thing that has ever happened to the Assyrians. Because there's such a danger of delusion, diluting to, to take place, being diluted in views of how a government is to be run, being diluted in views of morality and ethics, even understanding spiritual truths because here in America we are living in a nation that started off very well and is now on a toboggan slide that is very dangerous and uh, we are now seeing in a lot of the conflict that's going on how deep our despair is becoming in America and we're at a turning point and a crossroads in America well that is going to be true for Assyria as well again she is going to have to shed a lot of things because she's become cultured in so many different ways around the world and so many different religious views uh, have been affecting her. And so all of that is going to have to be shed as she comes back to a totally thoroughly biblical worldview and as she comes back to who she is and what she is being raised up of God to be. And so while she has been under attack in the past physically, now she is being under attack morally and ethically and religiously by the dangers of the diaspora. So it's very easy to say, you know what, I don't want to go back there because there are dangers there. I'm comfortable here. Well, there's a danger in that. Uh, Abraham, when he began to follow God, the father of faith, when he left and he was following God, God led him directly into a land that was in drought. And he lost faith and went to Egypt and nearly lost his wife and his life. And then he began to follow God again. Following God does not always lead us to a bed of ease, to a plush green valley. Sometimes it takes us to the harshest places on earth. But 
in that we are learning to believe and trust God, not circumstances. And it's so important that Assyria understands that one of her main roles in the world, where she's going to impact the world, is developed faith, true, genuine faith, not faith in, in our creeds. Yes, creeds are important, but faith in the God of those creeds. We're, we don't just believe about him, we believe him. And we follow him knowing that he does know where he's going and what he's going to do. So in your opinion, Dr. Susak, you think that the prophecy is happening right now, or it is going to happen here soon? I love the what I learned from your patriarch. Um, he gave me the great honor of blessing me and blessing this project and blessing the book, and he even wrote in it. I, I'm so honored by that and, and encouraged. However, uh, as we see, uh, the, the events of the world coming together, I see the Assyrians having gone through all of this trauma, being shaped and readied and prepared. And I, I think that, that we are moving toward, we know we're coming into end time days. Now that doesn't take any kind of a mystery. Just read your Bible and read your newspaper and everything the Bible says to look for in the changing of the seasons is here. In that light, a number of theologians have asked me, well, Ron, is not this prophecy about Assyria a millennial prophecy, that it happens when Jesus comes? My answer is yes, no question about that. However, there is no reason why the process toward that prophecy should not begin now. Noah did not begin to build the ark on the eve of the flood. He began 120 years earlier. Now, your patriarch, when he blessed me, wow, what an education. And that is that he said that all prophecy, according to Assyrian theology, was fulfilled in Jesus Christ at the cross. Yes, he's right. He's absolutely right. When Jesus said it was finished, the Assyrian prophecy was fulfilled. It was done. It was a fulfilled, a full, fulfilled deal. Now, let me try to illustrate this. Uh, I don't know how old you are, and I'm not going to ask you to tell us, but let me say that everything you are today, the color of your hair, the color of your eyes, the shape of your face, everything about you today was all established at the moment of conception. And you were complete at conception. Now, it's taken all these years for you to develop and form in that completion, but you were complete at that conception. When Jesus said it is finished, the Assyrian prophecy was finalized, finished, complete. Now we are seeing the process of that coming into its fulfillment and completion. I have every confidence that there is no reason for the world, the church in particular, not to begin to move toward establishing Assyria that she may be in that place ready to go when the Messiah comes. So in your opinion, what I know you're, you've mentioned the church and us as Assyrians, we know, you know, like you said, we want a homeland or we want sovereignty. We want a right to our ancestral homeland. What can the average listener do? Someone who has no idea about Assyrians. I mean, you've spent years researching all of this. So what can the average listener do who may not be Assyrian or who may not be involved in the Assyrian community very much? I beg of them, get my book, begin to educate yourself. The book is a foundational book. It has tons of footnotes. So if you want to expand your research, you know where to go and how to do it. And they can do that very simply by contacting us at the assyrianproject.org. Let me say it slowly again, the assyrianproject.org. We need to build awareness and knowledge and understanding. And we don't have to take a hundred years to do that. We can do that in a couple of years. We live in a day of media, a day of great opportunity to expand knowledge quickly. And so we could have millions of people getting up to speed within the next one to three years if we just get on board and move with this. So get the book, that's a beginning point. 
and uh, then then stay with us at, on the Assyrian project on that website as as we develop we're going to keep word out there as I travel the world when the pandemic lifts and begin to address Assyrians we want every every person to be there to be learning with us to become part of that family and so it's it's going to take a, a large awareness because at some point God is going to raise up a Cyrus of our age. Now Cyrus, if, let me just give a touch of history to lay the foundation. The Babylonians had kidnapped the Jews, or rather took them into slavery. And within less than 50 years, the Persians conquered the Babylonians and inherited all these slaves. Well, a man named Cyrus, now the king of Persia, said that he did not believe that they had any right to keep slaves. They had to send them home. And he financed Israel returning back to her homeland, financed the rebuilding of the temple, financed the building of the wall. And uh, he was the Cyrus uh, who, by the way, he wrote that philosophy on a clay cylinder. And Thomas Jefferson, when he was writing our constitution in America, studied the contents of that cylinder. And that's why America has built in our constitution, we do not go into a nation to conquer, we go in to deliver and then go home. We got that from Cyrus, who did that with the Jews. Now, somewhere, God is going to touch the heart of a Cyrus, because the king's heart is like water in the hands of God, and he directs it where he wants it to go. Somewhere, whether that person is a Christian or not, is not going to matter, because as far as we know, Cyrus was not a believing Jew, but he somehow knew and understood God. And there's going to be a Cyrus who's going to say, I see it, I get it. The greatest thing that could happen in the Middle East and to America and to Israel is to establish these people once again as a sovereign nation with protection. Dr. Susak, it's very evident that you, you know, you're very knowledgeable. You've done a lot of research. I'm sure Assyrians are very eager to have you speak with them. I'm sure after this airs as well, you know, a lot of people are gonna have questions for you. How is the response from the Assyrian community, the eagerness, the outreach, how is that all transpiring? And, you know, how do you look to take this prophecy to the next level? What are your next steps from here? I'm very encouraged, uh, Samaria, with the fact that this book has already sold as far away as Singapore, it's been selling in Australia, across Europe, across Canada, uh, across America, South America. In South America, in one nation, there's an evangelist who got a copy for his president. And so God is taking this book into some high circles, and we're very encouraged about that. The other thing that has a, us encouraged and a bit frustrated is the pandemic, of course, is uh, squelching the possibility of uh, public meetings right now. However, uh, there are already people and mechanisms in place that as soon as people are going to trust going back into live meetings again, uh, I have invitations to Phoenix, Arizona, Southern California, Northern California, Michigan, Australia. In fact, uh, they told me in Australia that uh, when you come, we're going to have between 10 and 20,000 people to hear you. And so there, there is a mushroom, it's like a mushroom cloud that uh, is amazing to me, but it's a good cloud. It's not uh, a dangerous cloud, uh, but it's growing even while I'm not able to be out there. Just from these interviews, people are responding. Um, every day I have people signing up to be on my Facebook. And what I want to do that I think is very important, and I've been praying about how to do this, and maybe this is the time to announce it, uh, I, I want every single Assyrian that ever hears what we're doing, uh, please write to me. Uh, write to me through the uh, uh, Assyrian pro the AssyrianProject.org uh, or any way, uh, and give me your address, your email address, your phone number, all privately held, and and let me know who you are. Are you a priest? Are you a bishop? Are you a laity? Um, and, and we need to build this great database because I want to begin more than ever to begin to talk to the Assyrian people worldwide. And, uh, and 
We even want to eventually have translators take what I'm saying and translate it into Swedish and German and uh, Arabic and all the different languages that now are being spoken by the Assyrians. And um, uh, so as we do that, we, we are going to increase building the bond of the Assyrians. And then my, my ultimate goal is, I shouldn't say my ultimate goal, but my big goal beyond that is to eventually have the, uh, a major, major conference between the, the leaders of the Christian church in, in Egypt, the one in Israel and Assyria, and for the first time in 2,700 years since the prophecy was given, let's sit down and begin to talk to each other. What do we need to be and do to be God's instruments to see this process toward fulfillment? Absolutely. I mean, just from my own account, Dr. Susak, I've been seeing the book. I have cousins in Australia that I've seen have purchased the book. Um, you know, I have family worldwide and it really has. And like I told you before, it's just uh, like exploded everywhere and everyone is talking about it. Um, even with the pandemic, really, I just it, I, I know it's because of the renewed sense of hope that it's not really particularly in a Syrian writing it. It's like I said, somebody who really had no idea Syrians even existed in modern times. And I think that's where the the hope comes from the excitement. And um, I think you did an excellent job with it. You know, you've been very insightful. Is there anything that you want the listeners to know? Anything that you would like to close with in particular? Well, the first interview that I did was before the book was finished. And I'll never forget the one question that was asked of me. And this person was very serious. He, he gave me the background of the sufferings of the Assyrian people and the betrayals. And he said, we have had many people come to us with promises ending up in betrayals. Are you going to be one of them? Bottom line, Samaria, I'm here for no other reason than for several decades, God kept drawing me along. I did not seek it. It kept seeking me out. And until it got to the point where I had to recognize there's a call on me. I don't have a choice. I, I, not that I would want anything else, but obviously you can always walk away. And, and, but I, everything in me was on fire that I've, I at least have to write this book. And the more I wrote the book, the more that sense of call and responsibility was falling upon me until now. It's a day and night passion. Uh, this week, this past week already, there were more than one nights when I was up in the middle of the night, just disturbed to be in prayer. And I am asking God to, to, I, I want to share this prayer. I, I was impressed with a story in the Bible where Jesus, a woman was asking Jesus to heal her daughter, to deliver her daughter. And Jesus said, why would I give this to the dogs? And the woman said, the dogs eat the crumbs off of the master's table. Now they were talking about the difference between Jews and Gentiles. And Jesus said, because of your faith, your daughter will be well. And she was delivered. And I've been praying, God, I'm not asking you for anything too great. I'm asking you for crumbs, crumbs off of the Jewish table. And you opened a sea. You dropped a giant. You brought down walls. You rearranged nations. You're the king of the nations. You raise up leaders. You bring them down. God, it is no more than like crumbs for you to resolve the Assyrian issue, to raise her up, to give her a global voice, and to make her the, the gospel-oriented megaphone of the gospel in these end time days, and to prepare her for her seat with the Messiah as he rules the world through Israel, Assyria, and Egypt. And uh, so for me, Samaria, it's a driving passion. It doesn't leave me day or night. And uh, my only hope and prayer is that what God has inflamed in me will continue to inflame in others as they read the book, as they become encouraged, as they gain a sense that 
this could be the time. This is not a, simply a pit stop. Uh, this may be the time where we start racing toward the end, end zone. And uh, so above all, we need people praying. I mean really praying because this calls for spiritual warfare because how many centuries have we realized Satan has done everything in his power to stop this prophecy? He hates the prophecy and he's tried to stop it. That cannot be. He was broken at the cross and we're going to take that victory and move forward as God leads and empowers to see Assyria reestablished. And then finally, above all, please, we're not trying to sell something. We're trying to build something. Get the book. Write to the Assyrian, uh, the Assyrian project .net or .org, the Assyrian project .org, and get a copy of the book. And if you already have a copy, or if you're a Syrian, do what many are doing: buy ten, buy fifteen, buy twenty copies, and pass them out to friends and neighbors and loved ones. You've got to help me educate the world about this great prophecy and what God has predetermined He's going to do, and you're the people. And, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned, uh, you know, to buy the book in bulk, Dr. Susak, because like I said, we were all eager to see what the contents of this book was. And when I personally tried to go on the site, um, it looked like there was uh, so many users on the site that it had crashed. But my friend ended up getting through and she bought about four or five copies and uh, was able to pass it out to us. And I know you have the book. Um, right behind you on that poster there, but I just wanted to uh, show it to the viewers. I'm not sure if they can see it, but this is what it looks like. And um, it's it's very informative. It's one of those books that I think I'm just gonna have to read it one more time, where you learn something new every time you read it. And that's what I'm finding, you know, even when I was going back to look for direct quotes and the proverb that you know stuck out to me and the Semitic massacre you know just so many things that are in there that uh, even reading it two or three times it's still so insightful it's still uh you know so well written so um thank you so much for your time Dr. Susek and the time that you've really dedicated putting this book together and the the Assyrian outreach and the community outreach um, you know, I can speak for myself. Uh, it, it's really, you give us a sense of hope that I think we've all been longing for. And, uh, you know, I'm so excited to see where this goes. Absolutely so excited. I am too. And I am so thrilled to have you as a friend. And thank you for the privilege of being with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you again for joining us. This concludes our segment on Shamira Media. Please share this segment with friends and family and encourage each other to buy the book, The Assyrian Prophecy. The link will be listed below. Thank you, and we hope to see you on the next show.